Hello and welcome to PAVE's sixth uh, virtual panel uh, in our series. Um, today we will be discussing autonomous logistics, quietly changing how things move. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of interest uh, lately in this for a whole bunch of reasons, including um, you know, the rise of, of uh, delivery in, in the COVID-19 pandemic. We will be discussing that and, and much more. Hopefully, you'll, you'll come away with this, uh, from this with a, a, a better understanding of um, you know, the applications for uh, autonomous drive technology in, uh, in logistics and in, in this variety of, uh, uh, of applications, um, as well as how uh, COVID-19 is affecting the companies in those spaces. Um, so we've got a, an amazing panel of guests. I'm extremely excited to have um, this group. Uh, first up, um, I'd like to introduce Matthew Lipka. He's the head of policy at Neuro, a robotics company building and deploying fully autonomous on-road vehicles in the last mile delivery service. Matthew, welcome. Thanks, great to be here. We also have Adam Simkin. He's the VP of Business Development at Autofleet. Uh, the first vehicle as a service platform for fleets. Um, Adam uh, is joining us from Tel Aviv, where I understand it's quite late. Uh, thank you so much for staying up and chatting with us, Adam. Pleasure, happy to be here. And we have also Nancy Sun. She's the co-founder and chief engineer of Ike, an automated trucking startup building cutting edge automation technology to help improve the trucking industry in the safest way possible. Um, Nancy, welcome and, and thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks, Ed. Um, so as I said, you know, COVID-19 has, uh, has put a lot of focus on uh, the applications for logistics, uh, in particular delivery, uh, in, in the autonomous vehicle space. Uh, we want to talk about that, but, but I thought before we get into that, we would um, sort of establish a baseline um, and, and just sort of ask each of our, um, our, our panelists here, what was sort of the most important factor um, for for their companies um, in terms of identifying and and um, and starting a company in in logistics rather than, for example, robo taxis or or some other um, either autonomous application or something else entirely. Um, Nancy, uh, you're the founder of Ike, so I'd like to start with you. Sort of, what was it about trucking um, that that really that, that you saw the opportunity in? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think a couple of things um, that, that's super interesting about the trucking industry and, and automation applied to the trucking industry. Um, I think the first is uh, that that's um, on, on, on all of our minds, I'm sure, is um, is safety. Uh, and you know, it turns out that driving a truck is is um, the deadliest profession uh, in in the U.S. Um, and more people die driving trucks than than in um, you know other professions that you might consider to be uh, much more hazardous. Um, and so I think there's a there's an opportunity for automation to really meaningfully impact um, uh, safety in the industry. Um, and I think another one um, is just the, the broad impact of um, shipping goods. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the facts that we like citing is that um, about 150 pounds per person per day travels by truck. Uh, and so essentially everything that we touch, um, we eat. Uh, we own has probably been on a truck at some point uh, in its lifetime and, and journey to, to get to your home. Uh, and so um, there's an opportunity for just like huge impact um, in the industry. Uh, and then uh, trucks are actually a, a, a piece of um, a hardware that are um, fairly underutilized. Uh, and so, uh, you know, compared to uh, aircraft or um, other, other forms of, of transit, um, trucks uh, in general, are only utilized for about a third of their lifetimes um, that they're actively driving, right? Um, and so, um, and that's in a large part uh, limited by the hours of service limitations um, on drivers, um, which which exists for really good reasons. Um, but we also see a meaningful um, way for trucking to be able to uh, improve the utilization of a really high cost asset. Um, and then I think lastly is just um, really the scalability of the industry. Uh, there's already this like infrastructure, this amazing infrastructure called the, the highway interstate system um, that, that we're named after. Uh, and, um, and the ability for, um, for trucks that are designed to operate uh, on that highway domain um, and take use of an existing uh, piece of infrastructure that um, allows us to be able to, uh, to automate and scale across the country um, is, is, um, is really uh, fortunate for us. Um, so I would say, some, you know, those are kind of the three, three kind of main factors for us. Yeah. Well, you've already touched on a couple of the the big themes that we want to discuss more, uh, specifically the domain uh, and uh, 
and utilization. Um, but before we get into that in, in more detail, um, Matthew, uh, would you sort of tell us about what, what is, where does neuro see the, the opportunity? What, what was it that, that sort of is the, um, the vision that, that sort of launched this company? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Nurs a four-year-old robotics company based in in uh, the Mountain View area. And when our, our founders were launching Neuro, uh, they they set the mission of accelerating the benefits of robotics for everyday life. And and that is, I think, really what motivated uh, delivery. Because if if you think about our average day, we spend a huge amount of time shopping and running errands. It's more than forty percent of all vehicle trips is just going to and from the store. And and if we can give that time back to people. You know, this is 220 billion vehicle trips that we take every year, 40% of them to the store. It, we give that time back to people, you know, a huge impact on daily life. Uh, we're also seeing, I think, increasing trends even before COVID of, of demand for on-demand delivery. And so having uh, a, uh, an electric vehicle that's safer than a human driver, that, that has a huge potential for, for improving our roadways. The other way that we can um, accelerate the, the benefits of robotics and, and not just have this big impact on daily life is because there's no one needed inside of a vehicle that ha that's just designed for ca carrying goods. So one thing that's um, a little bit different about Neuro is that we are designing our own custom vehicle uh, that is specifically designed for last mile goods delivery. It's called R2 for robot generation two, we're on our second second model. And, uh, and this vehicle has no space for a human being at all it's smaller than a regular car but it goes on the road and uh, what that lets us do is you know first of all it has a hundred percent occupant protection right because there's no one inside those people are staying at home say uh, safe and sound and then we actually can redesign the vehicle itself to be even safer so it's narrower it's lighter uh, it has uh, pedestrian protection instead of occupant protection on the front end uh, so it can protect other road users and the, the development of software also is different if you're just focused on goods delivery. Uh, you know, we think about a, a regular self-driving car that's designed for robo-taxi might ha has to worry about three things, protecting everyone else on the road, occupant protection, and occupant comfort. And they have to make trade-offs between those things, right? You might not be able to slam on the brakes as hard if you have to, if you're worried about whiplash, you're worried about occupant comfort. But if we're just focused on protecting others because we have no one inside, like the neuro, like like neuro can do, that lets us really focus on safety of, of everyone else, and that actually not only improves safety but gets us to market faster. So, uh, so we've actually deployed this vehicle um, now in uh, in Houston, Texas, and Scottsdale, Arizona, um, and in California, and have actually been running a fully autonomous uh, goods delivery service for about two years um, in uh, uh, starting in Arizona and now, now in Houston. Great, thank you. Um, so Adam, um, I, you know, I feel like logistics is, is sort of this, uh, as Nancy sort of alluded to, is sort of this secret world a little bit where you know, um, it, it does so much for every day, but we don't necessarily see it all. And, and I feel like um, what Autofleet does is, is almost like another level of that, where even if you are aware of, of autonomy in, in this space, it's probably through seeing vehicles like, you know, like the Neuro R2 or seeing autonomous trucks on the road. Um, and and what, what Autofleet does is uh, sort of another almost hidden layer that, that makes all that work together, right? So, so um, maybe if you could explain what Autofleet is and, and sort of what the, what the vision was there. Definitely. <clears throat> and you're right, we are a little bit of maybe the black sheep uh, on uh, this, uh, this discussion, but I'll try to embrace that role. Because um, we really, um, I think the, the points of safety and the time to deployment are important. We're really looking at the sustainability and profitability of these business models. So our goal at Autofleet is we provide a vehicle as a service layer, which optimizes fleets of vehicles to operate in any business model. Um, so that means that we can take an AV fleet and have it seamlessly operate and provide passenger transportation services, uh, delivery logistics services uh, at any given time. And so for us, the real uh, key part of delivery is it's an essential part of that utilization equation. Um, and so how can we combine delivery demand as a core part of operations with the goal of having vehicles be as active as, as possible uh, all the time? And the great advantage of delivery is that we can even do it today with traditional fleets and provide the same platform that's needed for AVs um, and delivery can work out of those existing business models. So take, for example, uh, how delivery complements ride hailing demand um, and how logistics you know, might peak in the middle of the day or earlier in the morning whereas ride-hailing might peak at commuting hours. 
um, rental fleets. Uh, even uh, seasonality is a great example. Rental drops down because tourism drops down in uh, winter seasons, whereas e-commerce peaks around those times. So there's a lot of opportunities of leveraging existing uh, supply uh, to actually create this really smooth, robust demand curve to turn this into an overall uh, sustainable business model. And I think we're right in the middle of the best example of a global pandemic, right? People are not taking passenger transportation, rental fleets have seen their demand totally decimated. So how do you have a diverse enough uh, ability to operate in business models uh, when the time comes? And delivery and logistics is absolutely an essential part of that equation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, I want to I want to stick with utilization because I think it is it is really interesting. And and obviously, for all this to work and to get the safety benefits, um, you know, you need to have um, you know, you you need to make money, right? And and it seems like more and more of the conversations around uh, the business case it really revolves around making sure um, that these vehicles are utilized. Um, Adam, I want to come back to you, but but first, um, uh, Nancy and then and then Matthew, I'd like to just can you can you talk about sort of how the need to to utilize uh, uh, you know logistics vehicles in particular, uh, how that informs your thinking about about the design or the or the deployment um, uh, or just even you know the the business development around uh, the vehicles that, that you're developing. Nancy. Yeah, sure. Um, but, you know, I, I think I mentioned this a little bit in the in the intro as well. But um, you know, one of the things that uh, that automation enables for uh, for the trucking industry is higher utilization of a really expensive asset. Uh, and so, um, one of the things that that um, that certainly is uh, on our mind is how do we make sure that we're able to increase the utilization, right? So, um, I think uh, what ultimately it really leads to for us is a desire to to focus. Um, and, and for us, it's really around trying to focus on solving the problems that we're uniquely qualified to be able to do. Uh, and that's really on developing the technology to enable automation. Um, and, uh, and that's in partnership with the entire supply chain, right? It's, it's, um, it's uh, from, from the drivers to uh, the fleet operators to the shippers, um, everywhere, everybody within that ecosystem um, has a piece to play uh, in that. And, and for us, rather than focusing on, on trying to um, uh, trying to either automate or try to own the entire ecosystem. What we're trying to do is, is just really focus on developing the automation technology really well uh, in partnership with OEMs, in partnership with fleets, um, so the OEMs to be able to uh, build the platform and fleets to be able to operate the vehicles um, and, uh, and, um, and, and, and work with the entire industry to be able to, um, to, to get to the utilization we think um, ultimately would, would, would result in the greatest impact. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think people, a lot of times people do underestimate how challenging uh, the fleet management part of this can be. Um, Matthew, uh, were, were there aspects of the of the Neuro's design that, um, you know, had sort of uh, uh, utilization rates or, or that kind of duty cycle um, in mind? Or, or how, how is that consideration affected um, what, what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, definitely utilization is one really important metric that, that we look at for the, for the economics. Um, there's others, right? We have a low, very low cost vehicle. We had uh, a stack optimized for our use case, but, but utilization is definitely a, a critical one. And I think about this kind of the demand and then the, the supply or the vehicle side. So on, on the demand side, we have designed our business model to uh, be able to deliver all kinds of goods. And so far we've announced partnerships with, uh, with uh, Domino's Pizza, Kroger's Grocery, Walmart, uh, which is a retailer and, and, and grocer, and uh, obviously, and, uh, and CVS in the pharmacy space. So we have a, a diverse a range of goods, which, you know, getting back to, to Adam's point about, you know, you want pizza at a different time than you want your groceries, um, uh, gives us time over the course of the day. Um, we also are able to batch, which has the side benefit of helping reduce VMT. We've got two compartments in our vehicle that lets us uh, you know, increase the utilization as well. And, and I just add also on the demand side that we're in it together with our partners, right? So we, we partner with like our Kroger's and we were together to try and improve utilization, not just uh, our, ourselves. Uh, on the supply side, we actually have a, a, a cu this custom vehicle, right? And because we are um, actually doing everything from the software to the vehicle to the delivery service, um, the, the vehicle itself makes a big difference in our ability to uh, have high utilization. Um, so a couple examples. One is we have actually really flexible compartments that can be used for a variety of different things in a single bot, right? It can deliver a pizza or a, or a pharmacy or, or, a, or a grocery order. 
Uh, we also looked at our, our specs for to enable high uptime, right? So you think about battery, you know, charging speed, those things are really important to utilization because that's time that's not, not uh, in service. And then we also wanted to make our, our maintenance of the vehicle really efficient. So how can you do automatic diagnostics of things, you know, make it really easy to clean surfaces, particularly important uh, these days. Um, what vehicle components can we design to be easier to swap in and out? because we're building a vehicle for fleet usage rather than repurposing a passenger vehicle that actually gives us some some uh, opportunities to be really efficient on the utilization front cool yeah um and adam i mean utilization is is what you guys do what is the what is the biggest or what are maybe some of the biggest challenges in in sort of fleet management and keeping utilization up that maybe especially maybe ones that that people don't necessarily think about i know most people probably don't think much about fleet management, but but what are what are some of the things that 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 kind of pop up the most as as challenges? Yeah, I think um, if we if we look at a framework of what are these advantages in utilization that we especially we especially want to see with uh, with AVs, um, I think two of them have already been mentioned already by by Matthew and Nancy. So first of all, this ability to aggregate demand, um, right? So if you have a fleet offering a service, uh, you can turn to multiple different demand sources, multiple different providers. Uh, create those complementary demand curves that really have an impact. And that's different, let's compare it to on-demand networks you see today. Um, you know, a driver might work for DoorDash and Uber Eats, but they're kind of working in a siloed environment. So when fleets operate these services, they can really aggregate this in a, in a more efficient way. Um, so that's one. The second is the vehicle being able to operate more, um, more hours, as Nancy noted, um, right? So if we have a vehicle, Theoretically, we can have unlimited utilization. Now, that brings with it different challenges. If we want a vehicle to be up all the time, now we need to automate different parts of that aspect. So when do we service the vehicle? When do we clean it? Um, and now these new challenges that don't exist today because you know, a vehicle is down 12, 16 hours a day anyway, so there's lots of time to do those things. Um, and then the third, and I think this is really the key, is once we move to a, a, an AV, uh, all of the decisions now can be taken by a platform. So even basic things that we're used to in optimizing these environments, so things like matching or dispatching or route optimization, um, so many of them are actually decide, decided by operators in the network today. So even really, there's a huge technology step on the fleet management side of predicting demand, for example, and distributing the fleet according to that predicted demand uh, in advance, um, matching orders in a different way, creating optimized routes that uh, a whole set of capabilities that really uh, was never deployed in the existing on-demand networks we had today. And so um, there, there does need to be a step forward. It's not, we're not able to just take neuro vehicles and plug them into DoorDash. There's really a, cap a set of capabilities that's important to realize those efficiencies that AVs provide to us um, that needs to be built uh, in addition. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so I want to I want to get to the to a vehicle sort of related question for for Nancy and Matthew. Um, so, you know, I think one of the perceptions that uh, that that people sometimes have, particularly about trucking, uh, Nancy. So, maybe we'll start to you. Is that is that you know uh, this has sort of become more of a focus in the industry because some other domain is 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 easier. Um, and obviously, there you know. Uh, probably lots of different views on it. So, so just, I was uh, hoping, can you describe your domain? Like sort of what are the kinds of routes that you'd be doing? What is, what is the domain for that? And, and what are some of the either, either challenges and or opportunities that that, that domain provides? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so first of all, um, Ike is trying to automate the highway transportation of freight. Uh, and so uh, worth pointing out that we're really focused um, on, on essentially highway, on-ramp to highway, off-ramp. Uh, and, uh, and automating that journey um, for a truck, uh, which means there is this portion uh, getting from the highway to the local distribution center on, on either end um, that we uh, do think, um, uh, especially initially, uh, is, is best done uh, with human drivers. Uh, and so I think there's, um, there's a, a couple of uh, things that are interesting. Uh, first about the, kind of like the, the confluence of, of highways uh, and trucking. Um, I think the, the first is like, what are the benefits of highways, right? It provides this very structured operating domain uh, for the vehicles and for the automation technology. Um, and that's in contrast to a lot of surface street navigation or industrial yard navigation where uh, trucks actually and drivers today are faced with like a number of dynamic challenges. Like there's no lane lines, there's forklifts zipping around in different places. There's people to talk to, um, paperwork to fill out, complex maneuvers to do with backing up a trailer and 
uh, and, and manual maneuvers to do with connecting, uh, you know, brake lines between the trailer and tractor. Um, so, so there's a lot of things that are that are set up already um, within the industry to be very manual. Um, so highways makes a lot of sense uh, because uh, you can continue to have people who are very well suited to do uh, the, the tasks that require humans um, in the surface street driving and the industrial yard operations. Uh, and then um, computers uh, in many ways are very well suited to uh, be able to perform the tasks needed for highway driving. Uh, and so that's for us um, why we're so focused on highways uh, is that it provides us a structured domain to be able to deploy the technology in initially um, and, uh, and be able to, to make progress towards um, automating, um, automating freight. And, and just really quickly before we get to, to, to Matthew, I just, I'm curious, like, does, is there anything that that, that domain that, that operating on the highway requires and just in terms of the hardware that maybe a, a, a or the software that, that maybe a robo taxi wouldn't or is particularly in a, an urban area, um, just, just kind of briefly, just to give a sense of that. Yeah, um, I think for, you know, you mentioned hardware, like for, for I think one, one thing uh, that, that is, um, that leaps to mind, I think for, for many people in the industry, uh, is that if you compare kind of trucks to cars today, uh, trucks or you know cars, you're used to having 100 or 200 thousand miles on them, and then you're used to like turning that over, right? Um, for trucks, it's an order of magnitude larger, right? Like you know trucks, uh, they they their first life is about a million miles, and then they get resold, uh, and then they drive for another million miles, uh, and so a lot of the um, the hardware that's on these vehicles um, has um, a really long mileage lifetime, uh, but in terms of years, that might actually be really short, just because trucks are driving all the time. And so you have this really interesting um, confluence of like very high usage uh, and very high mileage. Um, and so I think developing technology that that um, is able to fit that usage model uh, versus um, you know passenger cars, where you have an opportunity to uh, to be able to to turn that over uh, with, uh, with with shorter lifetimes. Yeah. And, and Matthew, um, can you just talk a little bit about Neuro's domain and and sort of how that's reflected in you know the the vehicle, the operations, the philosophy. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our, our focus is all about last mile goods delivery. And if you think about um, our first uh, our first use case of grocery delivery, um, your grocery store is probably, you know, in the kind of the center of the neighborhood, right? It's close to where people live. And that's our operating design domain. We're, we're going around and operating in uh, the area around the grocery store um, and bringing it to your house. Right? And so the, uh, that tends to be 25 mile an hour streets. Our vehicle's limit is at 25 miles an hour. Uh, it it um, tends to be um, you know, more kind of neighborhood, right? We're not gonna go on highways with this vehicle. Um, and so it's in, in some sense the, the opposite of what, uh, what Nancy was, was describing. One of the things that is different about that from from a robo taxi is if you get in a taxi you want to go where you want to go right or if you get in your personal car you want to go where you want to go here you don't you know we have defined our delivery area as these zip codes around a grocery store or around a Domino's and so that means that uh, we you don't even you know have the opportunity to order from the neuro vehicle if you're outside that because our vehicle can't safely operate you know, on, in that highway location. And so we can really actually bring a service to market without being able to go everywhere um, and still have a useful product or service that customers can benefit from and we can learn from, um, you know, really, uh, really easily. Um, so, so that's, um, that's uh, kind of the, the key thing about our design domain and where we, where we operate. We also kind of constrict the, uh, on some more dynamic things like weather. And so we don't operate in snow right now, for example, right? And, like we Houston and Arizona are pretty, pretty snow free. Yeah. Not a coincidence. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of one of the themes is, uh, of this, this topic um, is, is that, you know, a lot of this world of logistics is sort of hidden from, from consumers. It's not something that we necessarily are confronted with. Um, Adam, I, I'm curious uh, for your perspective on, you know, will sort of the, these changes in logistics, will, will people start to notice them at some point? I mean, obviously maybe you might see a vehicle on the road, but, but um, are the potential like, you know, the, is the potential to, to change how logistics work on a systemic level something that, that people will notice or, or is it just gonna be this thing that continues to happen kind of quietly? I, mean, I think, first of all, this is one of the most important things about um, these delivery use cases specifically with AVs and you know, we're here in the context of paved. So especially in terms of changing people's perception and, and normalizing, especially uh, this is a part of our actually lives. So like if we look at some of the human transportation options that exist out there uh, with, uh, with AVs, um, we're still pretty much at a case where it's kind of a novelty. 
Um, and it's not going to be my first choice to actually go from A to B. Um, like, I remember when I was growing up on my birthday every year, I would always ask for this space ice cream sandwich that was supposed to be like a disgusting dehydrated ice cream sandwich. Like it didn't get me closer to going to space. It didn't really make me feel like I was in space, but that was like, that's a, you know, low speed geofenced automated shuttle um, uh, today. Um, it's a space ice cream sandwich, but to actually provide a real service to you of you know, groceries that you want to have or like a pizza that you ordered, these are things that really make these normalize as a part of people, people's real lives and interactions. Um, and uh, I think that does start to actually have a real impact of people feeling like this is something, something uh, that's a significant part of their experience. The other side of it, as we kind of spoke before, is that unit economics here are encouraging um, and they can start existing uh, and being uh, uh, profitable um, in a much shorter time frame, which is another part, uh, as we see it, as that normalization. Um, great. And, and so we need to, we need to address, we are a little low on time, but, but we do need to address the, the COVID-19 sort of how that has, has affected all this, because that is clearly one of the things that has, has really driven a lot of attention to this. Um, Matthew, I feel like Neuro is sort of one of the companies that has sort of most come into focus um, because of, of your focus on that, that last mile delivery, possibly also because of you, you're a little more consumer facing. And so, um, and, uh, but, but I'm just curious, how, how has COVID affected um, neuro, its strategy, its you know, sort of how it how it sees itself in in the future. Um, yeah, I, you know, obviously we didn't design our robot for a, for a global pandemic, um, but I think what we have seen is that there's been just much more um, demand for this, and it's it's just an intuitive uh, case that if there's no one in the vehicle, this is con like this is contact this is truly contactless delivery, right? There's just the social distance of the entire trip from the grocery store to your to your house and i think that's really appealing and so uh what i would say is we've seen a few places where the um where there's you've, you've kind of highlighted the opportunity for the future but the scale we're at now right, we're basically we're pilot initial deployment scale is not gonna we're not going to solve covid 19 with robots but we're going to i think um, show the potential for for future for hopefully not for a long time but but for future cases where we need to do social distancing and so you know a few applications that, that we've we've used the vehicle in you know one we've got our delivery service in Houston um, that's been ongoing um, and at kind of triple the demand uh, than pre pre COVID levels right more more people are looking for that and that's been continuous because um, people do rely on that service um, a second example is we partnered with food banks in Houston, Phoenix, and Mountain View to uh, bring uh, essential food to people that, that are most unable to travel. Um, and then uh, the third case that we've, we've seen is uh, we actually took some vehicles and redeployed them to uh, temporary COVID hospitals so that we could transport uh, medical supplies, food, and uh, PPE for the nursing staff so that a f fewer people have to enter the area where there are known COVID positive patients um, or, or uh, suspected COVID positive patients in the testing site. And, and that's like, I, I think a place where we could really have a, you know, a meaningful impact um, on, on those sites today. And that, you know, I think we'll see more of in, in future cases. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Nancy, um, you know, I'm curious in your case, not just sort of how COVID-19 has maybe affected um, uh, you know, Ike and, and its strategy and its design and all that, but but also maybe like did did the pandemic uh, sort of uh, reveal any any weaknesses or, or or challenge? I know there were all kinds of supply chain disruptions. Um, did you see sort of an opportunity in in, in sort of what's happened in, in trucking and COVID nineteen? I, I I and I think a lot of people don't necessarily follow trucking super closely. Um, so I'm I'm just curious, both for yourself and and for the the sector that you want to you want to compete in. Yeah, sure. Um... Uh, I, mean, I think, you know, like, like all of us on this call, um, uh, as a company, we're trying to prioritize both the health and safety of our team, as well as, you know, our, our civic responsibility towards that of our communities. And so uh, we do have um, our company working from home and working remotely. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the upside of it is like, we've actually um, had, uh, we recently did a pulse survey of the team, and it's extraordinarily positive. Like, you know, I think people have figured out how to make it work and have figured out um, how to be able to be productive, um, even even in a in a you know what people are I think calling now a new normal, um, and so um, so I think uh, a lot of the investments that we made from a technology development perspective in offline testing uh, and in scalable infrastructure have really paid off for us. 
you know, we didn't, we weren't prepping for a global pandemic, um, but, but it was, it was what we thought was the right way to do development in general. Uh, and so that's really, it's been really nice to have that, that, that um, investment uh, in technology that's, that's usually kind of more behind the scenes and much less visible publicly um, actually pay off for us. Um, so from a, a team perspective, we're doing uh, super well. I think from a, um, you know, taking a step into a bigger picture um, from a, from an industry perspective, um, I think we're definitely seeing a lot of um, uh, renewed interest in the uh, application of automation, especially as uh, applied to trucking because of the supply chain aspects and uh, because of uh, being able to, uh, you know, I think one can project into the future and imagine that there's more, um, more online shopping happening, right? And so there's more delivery that needs to be uh, arranged between warehouses and such kind of behind the scenes. And so uh, certainly I think there are a lot of companies right now who are trying to think through like, what is the economic impact for them over the course of the next like 12 months? Um, but I think that folks um, in the industry have, a, have a, the, the folks that we've talked to have a much longer term perspectives and than just the, 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 the next year and, um, and are really um, positive uh, on, on automation for trucking in the future as well. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I wish we had more time. Um, I, this is such a fascinating topic to me. And, and I think, uh, you know, it's something that that because it's not as in, in people's faces as, as other applications, um, you know, we certainly at PAVE uh, want to make sure that people are do have an opportunity to, to learn about it. Because as you all done such a wonderful job of explaining, it's so important. Um, it, it's just so fundamental to uh, um, our modern lives. So uh, with that, I want to thank uh, all of our guests. I'm Adam Simkin uh, from Autofleet. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining us. Thank Matthew, Lip Matthew Lipka from Neuro. Thanks, Matthew. And Nancy Sun from Ike. Thank you, thank you all so much. And uh, thank you to all of our attendees. Um, we have yet another uh, uh, fascinating, I think, panel coming up next week. Uh, we certainly hope you will tune in for that. Um, and that will do it for us today. <laughs>